honored to be part of this uh, august panel of uh, experts, and I'm looking forward to hearing what they have to say. I'm just here to act as the moderator and to sort of give us a short introduction. And in this week's Parsha, Parsha's Achremos Kedoshim, we have a number of mixed votes that are very relevant to the topic at hand. For example, we have the mitzvah of B'Tzedek Tishvot HaMitech. You have to judge fairly your fellowship. Another mitzvah that we have is Lo Tamod Al Damreach. Do not stand idly by if your brother's or sister's blood is being spilled, whether literally or figuratively. We also have the mitzvah of Yahav Tolareach HaKamocha. Love your neighbor as yourself. Do unto others as you would have want them to do to you. And these also can certainly be applied to the Aguna. But we also have to remember that these mitzvot all appear in the Torah after all of the mitzvot of the arayot, which are the forbidden relationships. And the Torah is very, very concerned about maintaining a holy society. Part of the maintenance of a holy society is the way that we interact with each other. But a very important and crucial component of maintaining a holy society is making sure that the laws of marriage and divorce are properly maintained so that we do not engender within the Jewish community any kind of bastardy, any kind of mamzerut that could, God forbid, ensue if the law is not followed carefully. So with this in mind, let's talk about what an aguna is. What is the definition? The verb igun arguably appears in the book of Ruth in the very beginning. When Naomi says to Ruth, halahin teyagena, that uh, I, I'm not going to be able to be able to find sons for you to, re, to, to get married to now that your husbands have already passed away. And uh, some of Mephorshim understand that the word teagena in that context means that uh, a person is going to be deserted. So one way of it, translating igun is desertion. And another way of translating igun in that pasuk is referring to sort of creating a confinement or a circle around the person so that the person it feels trapped and can't get out. Both of those things apply to the modern day aguna. And today, it, um, it refers to a woman who cannot move on with her life because her husband has refused for whatever reason to give her a get. Um, in the times of the Talmud, the term aguna meant something somewhat different. It referred to a woman who was unable to remarry because we don't know what has happened to her husband. Her husband has been lost at sea and we're not sure if he's dead or alive. That's the classic term of aguna, but it has been, um, more, been more broadly applied to refer to any woman, even though we know where the husband is, but he's refused to give her a get. And here's where we get into some murky area. For one thing, how long must a woman be deprived of being given her get in order to be defined as an aguna? It's a very subjective kind of, uh, kind of definition. Furthermore, what if a husband argues, an ex-husband argues, that he will give the get once all of the custody and monetary issues have been resolved, whether that's done in Beitin or whether that's done in secular court? Is a woman who is now not receiving her get until all of the financials and custody issues are resolved, is that a fair definition of calling her an aguna or not. This is a, a murky area, a gray area, which I hope our panelists will address tonight. Um, another issue that needs to be addressed is that, th is that this has become, sociologically over the last several de a couple of decades, this has become a women's issue. And arguably, one could argue that uh, this is a men's issue as well. There are cases of uh, agunim, if we can use that term, of men who are desirous of moving on with their lives. And the wife has refused to receive the get because she's not ready. And halakhically, from the times of Rabbeinu Gershom, a man is not allowed to coerce his wife to receive her get. And therefore, while it's not as prevalent and um, it's not as common, but we do have a men's issue of aguna or igun as well. Um, we also need to clarify that there are certain challenges with Agunot in North America today. Um, I have not dealt with any Agunot in the Bayat to date in, in this community, but I have dealt with it in other communities where I've lived. And I can tell you that the problem exists where you have a few unsavory individuals who have succeeded in making their ex-wives or soon-to-be ex-wives miserable 
by not providing against. And this is truly abhorrent. But sometimes when we see despicable behavior, we are too quick to find someone that we can pin the blame upon. Do we blame the rabbis? Is this a fair indictment if we find that a woman is not receiving her get? What if you have a basin in the city that has done its, usmo, his, its utmost to prevail upon the husband to give his wife a get, and yet the family of the husband, and the, sometimes even the rabbi of the husband, uh, certain sometimes very influential men and women within the community, say no, we're not going to listen to the basin, we're not going to listen to the rabbis. We need to remember that the Torah is very clear, this is a biblical issue, very clear about the divorce process. As in marriage, it is a unilateral process whereby the husband presents the severance paper to his wife. It is not a bilateral process. The husband divorces the wife, the wife does not divorce the husband. Just like as a man marries the wife, he presents her with the ring under the chuppah, she does not present the husband with the ring under the chuppah. If we're upset with the fact that a particular woman that we know is an aguna, it is sometimes appropriate to blame the, the community, but sometimes it's not appropriate to blame the community whose hands may be tied in a particular situation. And we need to know before we are quick to make to, uh, to judgment. One might ask, and this is a little bit of a philosophical question, how could HaKadosh Baruch Hu, how could the Almighty create a situation like to allow a woman to become chained, so to speak, to, to create this kind of drama where a woman is, cannot move on with her life because she's waiting for her husband to give the get. And this is something that requires a lot of thought, and we, now's not the time, but in a nutshell, you have to remember that the Torah was given to an Am Kadosh, it was given to a holy society. God had certain expectations of the way people were going to behave between man and God and between themselves. And that sometimes it is possible for the system to be abused simply because some people can stoop so low that they fall below the radar of what the Torah expects of basic human decency. It's not an indictment of the Torah, it's an indictment of humanity, it's an indictment of the individuals in question. I was privileged to witness the delivery of a get recently here in Toronto with the basin that presides over Gid. Under the best of conditions, giving a get is a tragedy. Witnessing the delivery of a get is a tragedy where emotions run high and there are plenty of tears to go around. But I'm proud to report that the basin in charge of Gittin that I was witness to presided over the case with the utmost of kindness, sympathy, and sensitivity to both the man and the woman that was before them. And I, would tell, I, I preface that to you so that we have an appreciation and a sensitivity to some of the pressures that the basin is under and while at the same time um, uh, dispensing the utmost of kindness and sensitivity to the people and doing, uh, doing their best to be able to help the situation along. Um, and in the, therefore, in the course of our discussions, I asked about us to be mindful of the constraints under which our sages, both the Talmudic sages and our Latter-day sages, are operating under and not to be quick to judge or to indict. And finally, just to last framing of this discussion, when a couple decide to get divorced, just to go through the mechanics of the process, if, if God forbid a couple do decide to get divorced, one or both spouses will go to the basin to arrange for a get. When only one spouse is desirous of a get and the other spouse either doesn't care or is opposed, what happens is, is that the spouse desirous of a get requests of the basin to issue what's called the hazmana, which is a summons, it's a court summons. And a responsible basin will issue the hazmana, and here too it can sometimes become a little bit murky. In certain situations, uh, the spouse could refuse to appear for any number of reasons. He could, uh, he could write back to the basin and say, I will not appear before your particular basin for certain specific reasons that he gives. Sometimes those reasons are legitimate and sometimes they're not. A spouse could also simply ignore the husband. This is not permitted in halacha, um, but it's, and it's uh, truly lamentable that some people behave in this way, but this is what sometimes does occur. A spouse can say, I am happy to give or receive the get, but I first wish to finalize custody and our financials before proceeding with the get and based it. Here the based in, at least the policy of many Bhatti Din, including the based in that I spoke with here, will do whatever is in their power to prevail upon the recalcitrant spouse to separate the two and say, listen, just give the get, 
you'll take care of the financials and the custodial issues, either in Basin or whatever venue you choose. But unfortunately, many rabbis, even leading rabbis today, feel there is justification, at least in the short term, to wait until the other issues are settled before writing the get. Um, another issue is a spouse can argue, why should I give a get when my wife or my husband is suing me in secular court for a divorce settlement? And, and I'm being demonized and maligned terribly in the, in the court of public opinion and in the courts, and I'm spending a fortune on lawyers and so forth. So why should I issue the get or why should I receive the get? I'll choose rather to settle the custody and our financials in the basin, and at that time we'll resolve the get as well. And sometimes the one spouse could say, if you're going to take me to court, to secular court, then it's it's a little bit of a, of a hypocrisy to expect me to give you the get immediately. So this is also an area that becomes murky. And finally, when the basin is satisfied that there are no issues that would legitimately delay a get, and when the recalcitrant spouse continually ignores or snubs the basin, it is within the basin's purview to issue what is called the seiruf, which is a, a, a writ that says this individual has refused to acknowledge the authority of the court of the basin, and therefore this person is in some way uh, recalcitrant or under some level of ban, and it's really upon the community to determine how we deal with the seiruf. As it was once explained to me when a family member of mine was going through a divorce, um, the power of a seiruf really has lost a lot of its teeth in the 21st century. What's the worst that we're going to do to a fellow who hasn't, who refuses to appear to base him? We won't give him shishi, right? So fine, we'll go to the shibu down the block to get shishi. This is a serious issue. So again, what defines an aguna? We're back to, to step one. That's something will hopefully will hopefully be better clarified by our panelists. Thank you. Uh, the goal of my master's thesis was to see honest, open conversation and acknowledgement about this issue and the persistence of it in Toronto. So first, thank you all for making that goal a reality, particularly to Mel Tannen, Jonathan Jacob, and of course Robert Karofkin. Uh, thank you also for changing the date to accommodate my schedule, <laughs> and I'm truly honored to be um, on this panel of experts who are far more qualified and experienced than I am. I'm here today to share my perspective, my socio-legal perspective on Igun from an academic or scholarly point of view rather than a legal or halakhic point of view. What I propose to accomplish here is twofold. Number one, primarily to discuss the, the appropriateness of quantifying. And number two, and a more secondary and subtle goal is that I'll be framing my entire discussion around Igun as an issue of domestic abuse, language I believe we should all adapt. Although 2011 marked the 25th anniversary of GET legislation in Canada, I argued and proved in my MA research, as some of you may recall from previous Bates Sisterhood events, that despite the contention of some community members, GET refusal and extortion do persist in Toronto, despite the amended civil or secular legislation, thereby still trapping women in their marriages in 2012. Consequently, I consistently hear the question or critique in my research, well, how many agunot are there? Is it worthwhile doing a dissertation on a problem that has not yet been quantified? In fact, just last week, one of the leading support organizations on Igun in Israel uh, contacted me asking for research for the Knesset that shows that the numbers of agunot or Mr. get are declining in Canada. So while generally speaking, I in my own research am interested in a wide range of socio-legal issues about get refusal and extortion, primarily if changes in civil law result in changes in religious behaviors and what are the silences that surround this issue, I am first actually consumed with a quantifying quandary. That is, to count or not to count, that is the question. In a timely fashion, while I was in New York last semester doing archival research, a groundbreaking census was released, quantifying Agunot, and I want to share with you a bit about that survey and some of its findings. Spearheaded by Barbara Zakheim, founder of the Washington Coalition Against Domestic Abuse, and conducted by a DC-based national Poland research firm, the census polled community-based social service organizations across the United States and Canada. Responses were voluntary. Over 70 organizations were surveyed, but only 20 responded. 20 out of 70. 
Research began with the distribution of an Aguna survey in 2010 to these organizations that have dealt with Aguna or other victims of domestic abuse in the past five years. However, Aguna themselves were never personally surveyed. In designing the research, they set out not to sample Agunot themselves or the organizations that actually provide care to them, but rather only to conduct a census, a study of exactly how many cases of get refusal exist today and have existed in the last two years and five years on these groups' books. Based on the responses of the 20 out of 70 organizations, the census identified 462 Agunot over a period of five years suggesting that there had been an increase in cases of women being refused a get, during which time the, case, the rate of case resolution has actually been declining. The census also found, just like other victims of domestic abuse, that Agunot are younger women, more than half under the age of 40, 86% of whom have children, uh, they have little money and are unaware of the resources that are available to them. As well, the study determined that 61% had civil divorces, but not their get, a huge problem. In concluding the study, the claim made was that results provided evidence that Agunot are a growing segment of Jewry today, at least in North America. So before moving on to critique this particular census, both in its methods and goals, I'd like to first move on to critique quantifying more generally. Okay. Quantifying offers grounds for claiming authoritative knowledge of reality. People believe that numbers tell the truth and that they're needed for making change regardless of the actual people who are reflected in those numbers. The question then becomes who determines when the numbers come to constitute enough evidence or enough truth? Okay. How are the numbers interpreted? Furthermore, who is the well-trained authority capable of getting these immutable results and then reifying them as experts in the field, particularly when they themselves are not actually the ones who are experiencing the issue. So although Guna advocates are typically challenged by the desire to quantify because we may be viewed as less scholarly or less legitimate if we don't quantify, um, in fact, we may not be considered experts in the field because we are unaware of the scope of the problem, the truth is, I'm here to say, that numbers aren't everything. With that said, I want us to return to the sentence quantifying Agunot. It is my contention that attempts to offer a numerical value to Agunot are doomed to fail, and moreover that they are misguided attempts in the first place. In other words, the study is flawed, and let me tell you why. Getting an accurate number is impossible, and it's impossible for a number of reasons. Number one, there's a definitional issue. Before attempting to quantify a not, we must know and agree on a definition of the term, which we just spoke a bit about. Thus, we must consider the questions, who is an Aguna versus a misrevenant get? How do we determine these categories? Who determines them? And is there uniformity or consensus among and across Jewish communities? Generally, there are three instances in which a woman might become an Aguna, but our particular concern is when a woman is simply refused a get by her husband known more accurately as a misdirected get. It's quite common that support organizations or even rabbinical courts would only count the files that are open longer than a given period of time, perhaps a year or two, and in which case a husband remained recalcitrant. Similarly, cases that dragged on and on, perhaps um, so long that women just gave up, were not counted at all in the study. Cases that were closed due to inactivity were not included. And what about cases where the wife either refused to give up her secular civil rights in exchange for a get, refusing get extortion, or when she only receives her get because she did give in to these extortion demands. Where would these women fall definitionally? They would not be considered agunot at all and would not have been a part of the statistics. Furthermore, uh, different rabbinical courts and support organizations from city to city would have diverging views and definitions. Some would seek a narrower definition, therefore resulting in a smaller number, while others might seek a broader definition, resulting in a larger number. Arriving at agreed-upon definition, then, it is a prerequisite for establishing a valid statistic. And being that agreeing to this universal definition is impossible, a reliable statistic on this issue is then, by default, also impossible. And what's even more problematic <coughs> is that Zakheim's census does not address these definitional concerns anywhere. The second reason getting an accurate number is impossible is because there is an unchallenged or unacknowledged presupposition. 
What's clear is that only case files that have been opened or reported to support organizations would have been counted in the census. The study could not possibly be aware, nor did it seem to be at all concerned with, including women who have not opened case files in the particular organizations that were pulled. As a result, any women who are too frightened or too ashamed or too proud or too concerned with their children's well-being or privacy to return to particular organizations for relief do not exist statistically from the census's point of view. And recall that only 20 out of 70 organizations return the voluntary survey, meaning just like abused women, there are likely many more not in our midst than we'd like to acknowledge. It is obvious then that the second reason it's impossible to get an accurate number is the presumption for and need for self-identification of the Azunat to a support group or Beidin. Indeed, in order to count them in her study, Zakha needed women to have sought help from the particular organizations she chose to poll, being that the census was interested only in, porting organ in polling organizations about their Azunat cases women who presented themselves to the organization rather than attempting to track the women themselves and account for their stories and experiences with the issue. Of course, as with any type of domestic abuse, many of them have lived quietly in shame or fear, concern for the negative effects on themselves, their children, their extended families, and have either not reached out to a support organization or are unaware that organizations exist to help them. As a brief aside, it's just vital for me to note here that the burden of shame is not for them to bear, but is rather the sole liability of the recalcitrant husband. And I say this because the first time I spoke about the Abuna issue here at the Bayi, Shavuot 2009, one woman came up to me and said, we ought not to talk openly about this issue in our community. It's Lashon Hara, and women are often embarrassed. Abuna are often embarrassed. And so I'm here to tell you that it actually is our responsibility to talk openly about this issue. And in fact, every one of the Agunot that I have interviewed over the last few years wants this conversation to be happening, wants it to be happening openly, and in fact, despite their absence on our panel, they want to be included in it. Aside then from the definitional issue, as well as the presumption of self-identification, the third and final reason that attempts to offer a number uh, or statistics to Azunot are doomed to fail is because seeking a number clouds the issues and prevents meaningful and constructive engagement with and usurps attention from the actual issue of get refusal and extortion, anchoring wives to broken down marriages. Dr. Rachel Legmor, rabbinical advocate in Israel, said it best. She said, get refusal is the ultimate form of domestic abuse. Thus, the focus should be on the principle and potential for harm which may worsen from generation to generation. The principle is clear. It is an untenable situation that Jewish women can be held in a marriage, held captive in a marriage, from which they have exited emotionally as well as in a practical manner, but are unable to exit in a formal manner. That once married, Jewish women have no right to determine their personal marriage status that to attain the possibility of remarriage, a woman can and often is held up for an outrageous price in order to obtain a Jewish divorce, and even that a given individual, the husband, is more powerful not only than his wife, not only than her family, not only than the entire community, which is often silent on this issue, but most troubling, that an individual man is far more powerful than a Beit Din, which cannot dissolve the marriage against his will. In a secular court, a ruling may change reality, but in a baby that may not be the case. Judges may make rulings, but without actually judges making the rulings, and then number two, communal knowledge of those rulings, and then number three, communal action based on those rulings, indeed, a husband remains more powerful not only than his wife, continuing to abuse her, but also more powerful than the Beidin, stripping them and the Dayanim of their legitimacy. And these are two offenses we cannot remain silent about. These principles must be spoken about on the foundations upon which we all agree. Everyone here agrees that there are victims of get refusal, especially our rabbis. Everyone here agrees that victims of get refusal, who are most often women, together with their families, undergo great human and religious suffering. Therefore, the outcry should be against the very possibility of such instances occurring. 
and the untold suffering of the modern day Aguna, who again is not up here with us. Although all those who relate to the Aguna problem would do well to turn their focus away from numbers and to the voices and narratives of those who are actually encountering the phenomenon. We can argue, we can argue endlessly about numbers and the appropriateness of quantifying, but in fact, I'm here to tell you numbers are not the issue. People are. In principle, do 50 Aguna matter more than 500? The mantra ought to be, as I said in 2009, one Aguna is too many, rather than how many Aguna are there. The fact of the matter is, it doesn't matter how many Aguna there are, it matters simply that this problem persists. Last Shabbat, at the Women's Share, Rabbi Karapin spoke about Rav Soloveitchik's sixth knot in Kozozi Dofet, which I brought. Uh, it's a piece of a large, uh, bigger puzzle, this book, Fate and Destiny, which is a book that changed my life. And the message of the book was about turning faith into destiny, about turning a passive existence, or situations over which we have no control, into an active existence, actualizing our potential and filling life with meaning. The six knocks in the book symbolize six miracles in our time, and I feel that we, in our community, are at a pivotal moment on this issue for change to happen. There is a seventh knock at the door, and it's up to us to get up and answer it. Thank you. I received a call a number of months ago from a young woman I had never met and knew nothing about. She began the conversation by saying, I understand, I've been told that you are able to help women who are having difficulty obtaining a gift. I was in a dilemma as to how to respond. If I said yes, I'd be lying. On the other hand, I was hesitant to answer in a negative. I had no idea anything about this person's story. Maybe she had been suffering as an Aguna for a long time, and I was her last hope. What I did was deflect the question by inquiring about her situation and discussing it for a while. This story illustrates two main points I want to make this evening. First is that Halavai, there was a phone number. There was a contact person that a woman could reach out to and be able to get a get in any type of situation. It doesn't exist. And I thank Rabbi Kropkin for his outline earlier because it really dealt with a lot of the issues that uh, I would have to explain. The second point is that we may talk about a Maguna tragedy or crisis or issue, but it's important to remember we're talking about individual women with lives and feelings and emotions. And that's really who we're addressing tonight. In terms of the first point, Rabbi Kropkin really explained the whole idea of divorce and Jewish law and why there are difficulties. Practically speaking, there are two, but they did in Toronto, that are involved in this uh, area of divorce. First is run by Rabbi Ox. It's run very efficiently, expertly, effectively. Every Monday and Thursday, three rabbis meet, two, three, or four get them take place. Unfortunately, it's like clockwork. It, it, there's no shortage of uh, situations. The other big thing, I am not involved with that one, but Ox runs it very efficiently, as I say, on his own. The other big thing is the one that does Dine Torah, where there are disputes of all kinds. There's also a third that I'm involved with, which is uh, conversion. That's a whole other story. However, our Beitin will have situations where a get is not being given, we're contacted by the wife, usually sometimes the husband, and uh, request, as I can probably explain, that as mana be sent, the process be started. In the five years I've been with that Beitin, there have been five or six cases now that may not sound like much. First of all, we have to understand, as I said before, very powerfully, that one woman is suffering, if one family is suffering, one child is suffering, as a result of a woman's situation, that's too many. Also, it's just the tip of the iceberg. I don't think it's too large an iceberg. But there are cases that don't come before the base, because they're being handled quietly, 
hopefully being handled, sometimes we heard they're not, but being handled by rabbis, by people in the community. And then there are many, many people who don't even bother to do anything. There are, of course, women who don't know what a get is and don't realize they need it, and that can cause problems in the future. And there are women whose understanding of halacha is not that key, or should I say, observing of halacha is not that strong, and so if they try to get a get and the husband refuses, they just forget it and move on. Of those five or six cases we had, every single one of those women now have received a get. And what's important to realize is not because in every case the Beitin ruled husband give the woman wife a get and they comply. Sometimes that happened. But almost each one was a different situation. Sometimes it was the fact that they had received the husband, which motivated the man to decide he wants to give a get. Or it set a process in motion where rabbis and other people got involved, and one way or another, a get was given. How did this happen? And that gets me back to the second point. And I'll highlight it, the personal experience. Not everybody knows or should know that there are different branches of the uh, Vatican Din under the Vata Rabbana of Toronto. So I regularly get calls from usually women, sometimes men. Can you explain to me how do I go about getting a get? You know, how do I arrange it? And my response is call Rabbi Oxwell, 678-19676. That's, that's what I said. After a few months of doing this, I realized, you know, every single person who's calling me is going through a divorce. And that's sad. Okay, in some cases, maybe it's amicable and, you know, it has to be that way. But, you know, here was a relationship with promise and potential and so forth. And of course, the worst case scenarios are strife, where people are suffering. The husband, the wife, the children, maybe all three. So when I answer the phone now, and they ask me, and it occurred today, you know, how do I arrange a get? I tell them, call Rabbi Ox, 416-7819676. They're trying to say it with a little empathy in my voice. And I wish them that it should go well. And this is really the key to how most gifted that I've seen, most difficult situations have been solved. Where the rabbis involved have had empathy for the woman and her, her plight, where they understand that she's suffering. And so what if it's another six months or eight months? You know, she's still young. She's got a couple of kids, maybe. They don't look at it that way. If they understand this woman is suffering because she doesn't know when her situation will change, when she'll be free. When, she, when the rabbi who's involved, the rabbis who are involved, I don't mean just on the Vatican, I mean in the community, your own shul rabbi. The rabbis who are considered the um, elder state, statesmen in the city. When they have that feeling about this woman's situation, very often it motivates them to want to help that person. And when you get to that level, there are different ways it can help. You know, there are some men who are just total low lives and nothing will help. But, you know, a lot of them have a button that you can push. There are some who don't want to be seen as that. But one fellow who hadn't given his wife a get, called me one time, and apparently more pressure was put on him, and we were arranging a in Torah. So in one conversation, he said, you know, people are saying I'm a Russian. So I said to him, well, you are a Russian, but let's arrange for the in Torah. And I'm not saying this did it, but because of what was going on, he gave the get shortly after that, because he didn't want to be seen as a Russian. A lot of times, people are frustrated with their rabbis. They feel they're not doing enough. Um, when I started debating a few years ago, I was sometimes surprised by how relaxed the rabbis were with all kinds of situations. We deal with uh, you know, marital disputes. We also deal with uh, financial disputes. And I used to think they'd taken a stride. But you have to understand, the rabbis have been doing this 20, 30 years, realized that if you, you know, panic about every situation, that it can be you know, more detrimental and uh, helpful. Um, they sometimes understand if you're dealing with somebody, a, a man who's not going to get because he's got emotional or psychological problems, if you push him the wrong way, he goes over the edge, but likely he may no longer be able to, or he may not want to. If you're dealing with someone who is a Russia, you know, it's one of Newton's laws, the more force you put on, the more force he'll put the other way. So as I said you know, before, there are no magic solutions, but a lot has to do with attitude. And um, if we support the rabbis who have a sympathetic and empathetic attitude, 
and uh, we encourage other rabbi boys to do the same and help them to appreciate what it means because all rabbis in our community are men to be a woman who's in that situation then I think it can make a big difference on a practical level because as I said you know the ones I've seen have been taken care of there are other ones it's the tip of the iceberg and there are also men. I had one situation where a woman who said, yes, I'll accept the gift of $50,000. So, you know, that can happen as well. But it doesn't matter, you know, if it's a man or a woman. Um, and we should all have an attitude, like Rabbi Crofton said at the beginning, you know, where we are kadoshim. We act because we care about the people. Um, one of the solutions that we don't use in Toronto for certain technical reasons and for certain hashkafic uh, reasons and many of the rabbis is the prenuptial agreement. When I was a rabbi in New York, I used to encourage people to sign it. And they say, why are we talking about divorce now? And I said, uh, and before they, I would present it, I would turn to the husband. I said, do you love this woman? You know, I said, yeah. Do you care what happens to her? You know, I said, yeah. I said, well, this document says that you care about what happens to her. Because if you get divorced, you care that she's taken care of. And uh, that type of attitude is, you know, the one that I think is most effective. Um, thank you.
women um, and things that we could and should be doing and really looking at other communities and what has helped them there. So I'm going to move really quickly. I'm going to also start with, and I say this all the time, anybody who's heard me speak here or whether it's been at JSNCS or any other community, I always start with, with Pierre Keawa. Um, with Rabbi Hill said, I'll see for community board. Don't separate yourself from the community. Why? Because you can do more as a community than you can as an individual. And dealing and speaking about um, Al-Gunot and, and women who are trying to get get is a perfect example how as a community we could and should be doing more. Um, starting off by saying we're, we're failing our community, sorry, we're failing our women as a community, but there certainly is a lot of work that has been going on in the last little while um, that I'm going to tell you about. So let me start off very briefly. Um, about uh, telling you about the uh, civil uh, remedies. So I say fortunately, because it is fortunately, other countries are not as um, uh, fortunate as we are. Um, there are some remedies uh, available. In 1986 and 1991, the uh, laws in Ontario were changed to create what we call now as the get laws. Basically, if a spouse refuses to remove religious barriers, they do not have standing in civil court. Very powerful tool. What it means is, I translated into Judaism. Um, if a husband refuses to give the wife a get, the wife can go to the civil court, tell the court, my wife, my husband is not giving me a get, and it works both ways, but it tends to be more women, so that's why I'm talking about women. Um, husband's refusing to give me a get, and the civil courts will say to the husband, thank you very much, you're not welcome in our civil courts. Your wife can proceed. She can ask for whatever remedies she wants. She can ask for whatever court order she wants. And when you feel like giving her a get, come back and we might entertain. And this is, you know, a number of cases that I've been involved in. And surprisingly, this is used the most in Quebec. Quebec has the most number of cases um, in, in dealing with this area of law. But I've been very successful. You get court orders where the court will say, we'll give you 30 days. Go and give your wife a get. And if you don't give your wife a get in 30 days, we're striking your pleadings. You're not welcome in civil court. Um, there have been other cases where let's say, go and give your wife a get, and in the meantime your pleadings are struck, and after you've given her a get, you can come back and we'll give you standing again. It's a great tool, it's, um, th there's a big, big problem with it, and the big problem is, and one of the things we didn't talk about is what makes a kosher get, it has to be given by free will. And the problem in, in right now is that Beijing has said if you go out and you get yourself an order that says your pleadings are struck unless you give a get, a get and the husband goes to the Beijing and says I'm ready to give my wife a get because if I don't I'm, I'm really in big trouble in civil court, the Beijing will say we're really sorry that you're not giving it under free will and it's not going to be a valid get. There are lots of ways around this. And what we need to do is we need to work with the big dean, and we've begun that dialogue with them, is how can we make this okay? How can we, is there something out there, for example, that the wife signs a, uh, an order in advance that says, I'm getting rid of this, gives it to the big dean, so it's in the big dean's control, and then the big dean can go ahead with the get and then release to the husband the whole problems going on with the civil court. So it, it's something we need to work on, but, but as, a, as a remedy and as a threat, it is in a lot of cases um, uh, very helpful. And in one case, what I said to the husband, where the big dean said to him, I'm sorry, we can't give you a get, you're not giving it out of free will. I turned to the husband and I said, well, you really want to give this get? And he says, well, yeah. I said, then you need to convince the big dean that you're giving it out of free will and has nothing to do with the order. And we put it on his shoulders to convince the, the big dean that he was giving that free will. So there are things that can and, and, and should be done, but it's an issue that I'm raising that needs to be addressed and dealt with. The other guest law that we have, which is a great law, is um, if you sign a separation agreement, or an, an agreement uh, between a husband and wife, and you signed it for the sole purpose of getting a get, you can have a separation agreement set aside. It's a good tool, there's a big problem with it. And here's my example. Um, I had a very orthodox woman um, come to me uh, from a very, what I call, Haredi community, where the rabbi, uh, she signed a separation agreement because her husband said, I want custody of the kids, I don't want to pay spouse support, I don't want to pay child support, and um, I would like you to sign a separation agreement if you don't give her a gag. And I was a young lawyer at the time, and I was very naive, and I did not have a lot of um, experience in this area, but I had read this law, nobody else knows about it other than one or two lawyers, in, you know, orthodox lawyers. And so we went ahead, signed the agreement, she got her get, and the minute that he stepped out of the Bay Dean, we served him with our court proceedings to have the agreement set aside. The problem was, at that point, the rabbi said, now that you have your get, we no longer give you a heter to go to civil court. And the response to me was, that was the cost of getting her get. And that was problematic. Now, 
Some people have turned to me then and said, was this not a problem with the Beijing and was this not a problem with the rabbis? No. This is something that I should have educated myself on. I should have understand, stood the dynamics between the halakha and the civil law. But again, it's a dialogue that needs to happen between the rabbinim and between the, the civil remedies that are available and that are out there. But I wanted just to show you an example of how there is a great law out there. You need to be very careful when you're doing these types of things. Um, the other case, which is not a guest law that has to do with um, it just general on Ontario is most of you, um, or not most of you, anybody who's read on this uh, topic um, has heard about the uh, Brooker and Markovitz case. This is a, a famous case that came out because it was heard all the way up by the Supreme Court of Canada. And what happened was the husband had signed an agreement to give his wife a get and then refused to give a get. And, you know, uh, poor Mrs. Mark, I think it was Mrs. Markowitz, right? Was, was, was in a good for quite a while. And it went all the way up to the Supreme Court of Canada. And what they said there, and thankfully Justice Rosie Abella at the time uh, had heard this case, and she's uh, not only Jewish but quite a feminist, um, and went on to cite all the literature about not giving a get, how it's an abuse of a woman, and, and it's, it could be, you know, um, considered spousal abuse, and her concern and it needs to be rectified. And what she basically said is because he had signed an agreement, agreeing to give her a get and then didn't, she could award damages um, against the husband. So that case is sort of, you know, whenever I talk to the law society or, or, or um, give a lecture to the Bar Association, I always say to people, like, just put it a standard in your agreement. If you're doing a separation agreement for a Jewish couple, you add in one line that he's willing to give her a get, that the parties agree to attend in front of the Beijing for the purpose of facilitating a get. Um, and this way, if the problem rises and he still refuses to give it to her, um, then, then you've got, um, you've got an issue, then, then you've got a remedy. Um, one of the things that we've talked about is the prenuptial agreement. Um, the prenuptial agreement in the United States um, is a very powerful tool to the point where on the website for the RCA, they actually say that um, no rabbi should be marrying anybody uh, without having this prenuptial agreement. The concept behind the prenuptial agreement is if he refuses to give her a guest, then there are uh, financial consequences. Uh, to him for every day that she basically remains in under that. It's completely invalid uh, in Ontario, and I've been called a number of times. I don't know why people have my number. I feel like I'm the lawyer on call, but I've been called a number of times to give ILA independent legal advice for women or men who are getting married in the bite. Um, Rabbi Tal called me a few times. I think while Rabbi Bale was here, I was called once or twice, although I don't know that you were officiating on it, to give independent legal advice because it's not valid without it on this American prenuptial agreement, at which point I have to walk in and say, look, if you're going to live in Israel, great. If you're going to live in the United States, not an issue. If you're remaining here in Ontario, it's not worth the papers written on. I'm sorry, I won't do it. In the United States, if a uh, big dean hears um, a case, a family law case, if they arbitrate it and it's enforceable, uh, like an agreement. In Ontario, the same thing, the Beit Dean up until 2007, 2008, could decide an issue and the arbitration award was as valid as a court order and it could be enforced. The problem is legislation was changed because of this whole problem with Sharia law. We were caught under it. Arbitration award, or arbitrations are only valid now if determined by a certified family law arbitrator and it has to be um, determined under Ontario law. So it's a lot of information, but basically the base team right now in Ontario cannot arbitrate family law issues and have their orders enforced anymore. So the prenuptial agreement is pretty much invalid. Having said that, there are things that can be done in Ontario, and I'm going to talk in about one minute about, um, I know you're giving me the time, I know, <laughs> two more minutes. Um, we're going to talk about um, what we are doing to try and address that. But, but that is also a dialogue that we need to have. And also, the big dean here has to, has to feel comfortable with the prenuptial agreement, which there are some issues um, with the prenuptial agreement in the United States. So where do we go from here? The civil remedies are, are great. They're useful sometimes, but they're only one piece of the puzzle. And I'm going to start by saying the the community in Toronto um, is a wonderful community and under many different auspices have done some wonderful things, but the one thing that they failed at 
is, is any type of organization to support women and or men who are a us. And I, I, I always tell the story, for many, many years, Joyce Eckhoff, who was sitting here, ran a hotline, and she was the sole woman, or the sole person in the sole committee um, assisting women who were trying to get up and out, and there was a hotline number that if you were trying to get a get and you couldn't, this is the number that you could call and she could give you information. She stopped doing that, and a couple of years ago, there was an ad in CJN, and there was a hotline number, and I thought, oh my goodness, there's somebody organized finally in Toronto who's going to assist our women. And I called the number, and a woman in Montreal picked up. And Montreal was such a much, much smaller population than we have. Felt sorry for the women in Toronto, and the hotline number in Toronto was being forwarded to Montreal, and I thought, how pathetic that Toronto, with, with, with the numbers that we have, with the organizations that we have, have absolutely nothing to support our women. So what I am proud to say is, after speaking many times, um, there is a group of men and women who have now gotten together um, who are working very closely, both with lawyers and with the bait dean, and many of those people are here today. Um, many of the people from the executive are here today, if anybody's interesting. But looking at things like, supporting the women, having a hotline number. If you're trying to get a guest, who should you be contacting? What are the types of things that you could be doing? Working with the big dean. If the big dean says to me, we need a, you know, this get law is a problem for us, a civil remedy, but here are the types of agreements we need, then why do we not have a group of civil lawyers and a group of rebellions sitting down together and creating it? If we need a prenuptial agreement, um, you know, in Toronto, one that's valid in Ontario. Again, it has to be a dialogue between the community and the and the bait dean. Um, and our community, looking at all these faces, we had one woman whose husband was refusing to give her a get, give her a get, and we wanted to organize somebody picking outside where he lives because he lived opposite her. He lived opposite, you know, the, the center of the Jewish universe in Toronto. And I thought, how what a powerful thing that and, and the, the the we spoke to the Beijing about it. And you know, I started going through my Rolodex thinking which ones of my friends could I get together to come and do this. And I thought that's not appropriate. In a city of our size, we shouldn't be doing that. In a city of our size, we should have a core group of people that we could pick up the phone and say, you know, or put an ad in the CG and, and know that more than three people are going to show up. Um, so those are the types of things. Um, sorry. Uh, education, education, um, you know, talking to the community, going in and talking to our schools, letting our women know that they should be signing prenuptial agreements, and letting the boys know that it's not okay. Speaking to rabbis and letting rabbis know uh, that it's not okay to say, and, and I have to say this is my last little story here, but you know, I had one rabbi who said, if she wants a get, why shouldn't she give something up? For it. And I said, what would you like her to give up? And he said, well, maybe under halakha, she's not entitled to spousal support. And I said, Rabbi, I have a particular case. The husband earns over a million dollars a year. She's got seven children. I said, her kids, he said, well, she'll get child support. I said, no, 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 her kids are grown up now. I said, but he earns over a million a year. She gave up everything, and you're saying, and, and he didn't see eye to eye, and he thought she should be giving up something. And I had a lot of difficulty and could never agree with her. Um, Sorry with him. But why should it be okay to extort other concessions to get the get? And why people think that this is okay? So I, I'm going to stop here, but I, I do want to urge all of you, if anybody really is um, interested, um, you know, there are a number of people here tonight who are involved um, in, in this organization and working with the big dean and going out and speaking in the community and working with individuals who are trying to get their get. But really, if I can send you a message, the message is, A, as a community, we need to be doing more. We need to organize ourselves better than we have been. And if anybody thinks that there's a quick answer, I mean, really, there's not. It's not the rabbis, it's not the lawyers, and it's not the community. Every case, uh, you know, I agree very much with Rabbi Neil, every case is different. Um, you have to find what works in that one case. So is it going to be the civil remedies? Is it going to be the community pressure? Um, you know, the bite, we're going to approach the board um, and the rabbi about changing our bylaws. B'nai Torah has done it, UJA Federation has done it, other schools have done it. Amend your bylaws. If you are not giving the right baguette, you are not entitled to keep voting, you're not entitled to public events in the shul. It's very simple. A lot of other communities do it. It's something that our school should be doing.
just wanted to pick up on something, Sharon, that you had mentioned as far as this concept, which in Hebrew is called get me'usa, which is a get which is done is given under duress or under coercion, which is not considered to be valid. At the same time, we do have a principle that Maimonides addresses, the Rambam says, that if a person is, uh, if a person refuses to give his wife a get, kofin oso acha omer rotsan, we force him, not until he gives the get, but until he says, oh, I really do want to give the get. Um, and the way it used to be done in the good old days, I, I come from the wild west, is that they would take a fellow out into the back alley and they would say, would you like to give your wife a get? Let's give you an offer that you can't refuse. And uh, eventually the man would, uh, would consent. Um, and sometimes the stories go that in Europe you would find uh, them taking him to the mikveh and uh, giving him a nice dunk in the mikveh until he would agree to give his wife a get. Um, the question is, what kind of community responses are appropriate? Obviously, we're not uh, condoning or encouraging uh, the violation of any dina de malchus, of any law of the state. But at the same time, Canadians are so nice and so polite. When is it appropriate? When is it appropriate for us? At what level do, uh, of a recalcitrance do, uh, does it have to rise to? For us to be able to put this kind of communal pressure of picketing at a husband's uh, residence or um, or at his business and taking out ads. When, when when does that start? We have an organization in the states called the ORA, which uh, Yael, I know you're very familiar with. Um, should we have a branch of ORA here in Canada, and at what point do we start the picketing process? Um, I think there are two questions, and this is an interesting dialogue that I had with the Bay Dean, um, because one of the uh, shuls came to us and said, if you're, we're going to change our bylaws and say that husband's refusing to give his wife a gas, um, and you want us to implement these things, how do we know? And, you know, one of the it was simple responses was, we know because the Bay Dean has issued a husband up, which is a problem because our Bay Dean here does not issue husband up um, as a part of their process, their regular process and policy, and in fact, if they have a sense that the husband will not attend, they actually won't issue the husband up. Um, I've seen them issue it a few times against women here. I've never seen them issue it against men, and again, I'm going over the last 15 years, they just don't do it. Um, so one of the dialogues or discussions we have with them is finding some other measure or some other way to identify that um, the husband is refusing to get again, other than what is the standard in some other communities, such as issuing a husband up. Um, but when is it appropriate, what's appropriate? There are extremes. Um, I actually met somebody who is paid by the, I wasn't clear if it's the Israeli government, the Israeli army, who actually does travel the world and still does do the whole breaking your kneecaps, we're going to, you know, try and convince you you really want to give the gap. I think that's extreme for a city like Toronto. Um, <laughs> But, but when is the response appropriate? I think any woman who has asked for the get and the answer has been no, almost regardless of the reason, it sh a get should no longer be tied to anything for any reason. And although there might be a lot of grounds for not giving a get, such as saying you want all other issues resolved, um, sitting here, it just it's just an excuse. It's just a reason. Um, the get itself is not really tied. You don't lose anything by giving the get. You don't lose your rights to your children. You don't lose monetary rights. Same with the civil divorce. You don't lose any rights by actually giving the civil divorce. In civil law, we separate the two. You can give get your civil divorce and the rest of the action continues. There's no reason that, I, I know there are some halakhic reasons, but there really isn't a reason that you can't give again and still have all the other issues arise. And, and Rabbi Bill, you might tell me, or Rabbi Kroc, that there is, but um, uh, my feeling is that if a woman is if, if a woman is being denied to get, there really is something that we should be doing. And we need to have in place a sort of process of here are the first steps, here are the last steps, and the last thing really would be, you know, public embarrassment, et cetera, et cetera. And again, it's got to be done out of the offices at the Bay Dean. I want to clarify one point that Sharon said. Um, as I mentioned before, there are two about they didn't that, that are involved. So the person comes to the office vaping, uh, so the wife comes, the husband doesn't, or he's making all kinds of demands. 
where the doctors may be more trying to deal with it, and maybe not issue a husband that. But the cases I referred to earlier, that's when the people come to us, and Rabbi Ox, you know, sometimes refer them to our baby. So I get a call from him say Rabbi Ox asked uh, uh, that your baby issues a uh, husband not. So it does get in those situations where it's sent to the husband. That does happen. And Rabbi Karapin's um, issue is very um, complicated, this whole idea of when, they, when is it brought Sa'andi, when are you doing willingly, when are you not. The uh, prenup agreement in the United States that Sharon described before, it's not that it says there's consequences that the husband won't give again, because that could be problematic. What it says is that if the marriage breaks down, that the parties agree to submit themselves to the jurisdiction of Beijing X. Um, and, and when they put themselves before the Beijing, now they're obligated legally to solve their dispute, including everything, uh, including the gap. And if they don't come before the Beijing, they can go just for the issue. Yeah, it can be you can cross that for certain parts, so whatever they agree to ahead of time. Um, and if the husband doesn't come to the Beijing as he's agreed to, then there's a financial penalty for not coming to the Beijing. So it, all these things have to be crafted in such a way. Uh, and uh, the chair mentioned before that the Beijing will sometimes have a uh, side agreement so that uh, the woman will release this order. Also, you know, we had one case not long ago where um, the husband didn't refuse, both parties were coming, but we were afraid that if he didn't get what he wanted in the Beijing's order, he wouldn't give the wife again. So what we did was the, um, the Beijing, our Beijing decided what would happen with custody, that was the major issue. And we, they made the order, we put in a sealed envelope, we went to Rabbi Ox's Beijing, the husband gave the get, the get freely of no will, then we gave each side the order of the Beijing. He was not happy with it, but the get had been given uh, you know, freely, there was no question they had given it freely. And uh, so it's, it's the fine line very often, and each case has to be dealt with on its own. And sometimes, unfortunately, and I'm sure Sharon sees is that people will be with the only grab of Beijing for a while and nothing's happening because they're trying to gauge, you know, is there a way of getting the husband to come? And if it doesn't, sometimes we see it, sometimes it's handled differently, sometimes it takes too long, you know, these are judgments calls that, uh, that are made. I'm not the legal expert, I'm not the halakhic expert, but I've done a lot of research you know, from a lot of different Jewish communities around the world, and at least from my perspective, it seems that issue and husband not, and then the communal reaction to the husband as I mentioned, that's a minimum. It seems to me that those are pretty, that, that's a pretty uh, subdued, actually, uh, remedy upon which actually in halakha we can all agree. This is not something that's hugely controversial. This happens in pretty much every Jewish community, Orthodox Jewish community, and to me that seems as our first method moving forward. What we can do, that to me, that's the logical first step. I'm going to ask two more questions and then we'll open up the floor. Um, we've already heard from our panelists that one of the areas potentially for improvement is to, as for the Bate Den in town, to issue more Hasmanot. Now, the question arises why wouldn't the base then issue an a Hasmanot? The reason is quite practical. When a base then issues Hasmanot that are continually ignored, compromises the efficacy of the basement wholesale. And therefore, a basement may decide that when they know that they're going to be just snubbed, that they're not even going to get started. That, of course, that doesn't necessarily help the situation for the Aguna, but we can certainly at least sympathize with the psychology of the basement. That's one area which has already been suggested where there's room for improvement. What else? Uh, can, can you give us a couple of very practical um, uh, in nutshell issues where you feel that there's room for improvement in the process, the way things happen here in Toronto. Do you mean specifically the Beijing or in the general? The Beijing or in general. <coughs> um, so one of the things that we've identified um, already in our discussions with the Beijing is, um, is really just letting people know what the process is. That um, in many other cities, if you Google, because that's what we all do these days, if you Google Beijing, you know, process, get, um, in Toronto there is nothing. And just the mystery behind uh, what goes on and what the process is, 
um, I think helps take away uh, some of it. I think setting up, a, even putting it down onto a website and setting up the process and procedure um, so people know, here's how I go about asking for a, a get, here's what I need to do and here's what's going to happen if I don't get one. Just thinking through those issues and making those public and available to people um, is, is very helpful. Um, uh, other things that we've identified as far as moving things forward, uh, I mean some of the women who are here today would probably uh, be better able uh, to answer that, but I think advocacy, the sense that our community um, needs to be in a better position to know how to advocate and working with the big team on um, advocating better for these women. But it, it's dialogue. If you ask me, in a nutshell, what we need, we need better dialogue. We need people in the community to come out and help. We need a better dialogue with the big team, and we need women to know that this isn't their embarrassment, that really, you know, it should be the embarrassment to the men. We need, need people to change their mindset. I think a very important component of this whole discussion is that the Vada Ravana, the organization of Orthodox rabbis in the GTA, is a uh, underfunded and uh, not very, how do I say, it, a complex organization. The main reason for that is that, unlike many other communities, the fund is separate from the COR. In uh, Montreal, the MK uh, is part of the VAT, and therefore they generate income, and they have uh, people who are employed by the VAT who uh, work for both. Um, so therefore, our VAT here is not as sophisticated. And if it was, it would be great because what Sharon's saying is we should have a website where we are able to show what the process is. Uh, I agree with it totally. And there should be more you know, mechanisms for publicizing and for having dialogue. Um, I will turn this over to the community. Anybody wants to help with fundraising or just giving them money uh, so that we can do that? I'm mean, being serious. Um, it would be extremely helpful. We do, the VAT does get money from the uh, Federation. It's not a lot of money, you know, relatively speaking, but it's very helpful to be able to operate. Um, if we were able to become a more sophisticated operation, I think that would go a long way. Um, if you try and call, the, you know, the Bhatti Dean in Toronto, you do not get, uh, you know, a receptionist. It's uh, you know, more you know, ad hoc in terms of the way it's run. So, you know, that is part of the, uh, you know, the Richomo territory, part of the um, Sorry. Um, just to add, um, sort of a couple of things. I think, um, like I said, like I began, the real issue in Toronto, at least in the ha past few years, has been that nobody's talking about it. So that's obviously changing. I think the main thing is we need to be talking about it, but not only that we need to be talking about it, we need to sort of shift away from contentious issues. So I think we ought to agree when talking about it that um, Igun is a form of domestic abuse. It does happen most often to women rather than men. There's just a minority of men. Um, and also that um, the get is non-negotiable, right? This, this whole idea of extorting for a get or what you're going to get in exchange for a get has to stop. It just, that's at the basic, right? And this is very, this is an aura's mandate, this is what they do. They frame the whole issue in these ways, and I think that that's a good starting place, at least for our conversation. I think I'm going to put aside my last question just to, just to add uh, one final comment to what has been said. One would think that at the very minimum in the uh, electronic and technological age in which we live, a website for the based in which has an online application for a get with an explanation of the process and what you can expect as far as someone getting back to you would be something that at a bare minimum is something that we, uh, the, the women or men in our community should be entitled to um, uh, so that at least they can expect to know the process and uh, have someone get back to them. So. You're laughing at it, but one of the things we're looking for is someone to help us develop that website because the group of, of men and women that we're working with them, we don't have a name yet, and we really should. Um, but it is a, a nice group of people, lots of stuff can be, they are working with the big team to put together um, a website because what was um, 
identified for us from the Bay team is exactly that. They don't have the financial resources to put it together, so our group has volunteered to go out to do the research to look at other um, websites available and to actually put it together for them. I talked about the prenuptial agreement. Um, you know, I've got a group of lawyers who are working, who are prepared to uh, work on that and work with the Bay team in coming up with something. Um, so, so these are all very practical things, but they're just really baby steps in the, in the point that we don't have a name yet. So if anybody has a good name for this group, too. <laughs> Um, just speaking for the rabbinic community, I can only speak for my role uh, as the rabbi of the Bayat. Uh, if if um, anyone in the Bayat, which is a pretty large shul, uh, is discovered to be uh, again, is trying to prevent their wife from getting a get, you have my promise that I will go after you with a vengeance. <laughs>